We are so honored tonight to welcome Susan Cheever, best-selling and highly esteemed memoirist, biographer, and novelist, as she launches her newest book, Drinking in America, Our Secret History. You'll tell us the secrets. Her distinguished bibliography includes the 2015 biography of E.E. E. Cummings, A Life, which was chosen by The Economist as one of the best books of that year and is now considered the definitive biography of that iconoclastic, shall we say, poet. And other biographical works include American Bloomsbury, the leading figures of the Transcendentalist movement, and My Name is Bill, Bill Wilson, His Life and the Creation of Alcoholics Anonymous, and Home Before Dark, the groundbreaking biography of her father, writer John Cheever, and Treetops, a memoir. She's also the author of five novels and a frequent contributor of essays and articles to leading publications. Ms. Cheever is influential in shaping and sustaining our literary culture as a member of the Corporation of Yaddo and of the Authors Guild Council and is a faculty member at the Bennington College MFA program and the New School in New York City. In her fascinating and compelling new book, Ms. Cheever traces the pervasive influence of alcohol at key moments over centuries of American political and cultural history, from the beer shortage-induced illegal landing of the pilgrims at Cape Cod to the assassination of President Kennedy and President Nixon's last days in the White House, and explores its impact on many historic and literary figures in between and since, all toward asking the central question, what forms a national character? Ladies and gentlemen, Susan Cheever. Hi, thanks for coming. And um, yeah, the pilgrims. So uh, it's, um, it's a great honor to be here at a story that's really the center of the literary universe in this country, if not the world. And um, I'm just going to talk about this book a little bit and read three short sections from it. And hope that it somehow informs you and intrigues you at the same time. One of the one of the great privileges of being a writer is that we get to make history come alive, which is really fun. We get to take the pictures off the wall and make them dance and make them eat and make them drink and make them fall in and out of love with each other. We can notice that Ulysses S. Grant was a short man who adored his wife or that Alexander Hamilton hated drinking because his father was a drunk who took off and left him with his mother, or that Henry Thoreau was Louise May Alcott's favorite teacher. And we can include not just the momentous events that happen, which is why we put these people in history books, but also the texture of their everyday lives. Did their shoes hurt? How were they feeling about themselves that day? Were they thinking about what they were going to have for dinner, right? That kind of stuff, uh, which really takes us there into history. The food, the sex, the clothes, and of course, the drinking. In this book, by looking at drinking in America and showing its influence on events, I've tried to bring our heroes and our villains to life on the page. I hope that if you read this book, you'll come to think of John Quincy Adams as a sad friend who lost two brothers and two sons to alcoholism, and sympathize with Henry Kissinger, who had the unenviable job of babysitting a drunk. This book has, I spanned, you know, four centuries in this book. It's, it starts with the pilgrims. We'll get to that. It goes through the American Revolution, the Civil War, Senator Joe McCarthy and the Red Scare, the JFK assassination. Oh, you know, I just took a bunch of events, uh, in which alcohol seemed to have 
or did have a huge effect on what happened and went through them starting in 1620. So it really all begins with the pilgrims, and I'm going to start with them as Rhonda did. And I'm hoping I can find a way to read and have you hear me at the same time. And I'll probably go for about, I think it's about 18 minutes, Sarah. My daughter's in the back. She timed me earlier. And then I hope you'll ask me questions because I love to answer questions. And as I'm sure you all know, when Henry David Thoreau moved to Walden Pond um, in 1845, the last thing he had in mind was writing a book about it. He really didn't have anywhere else to live. He'd moved in with the Emersons to do a favor to Emerson because Emerson went to Europe and the household needed a head. Emerson came back from Europe to find that Thoreau had done his job all too well. And Emerson said to Thoreau, you can't live here anymore. And Thoreau said, but what am I going to do? Move back in with my mother? I'm 35. And Emerson said, well, I have this woodlot on Walden Pond. And why don't you go out there and build yourself something? And so Thoreau did, but he didn't think he was going to write about it. He thought he was going to write a book about a, a river trip he took with his brother. But Hawthorne asked him to come and give a little talk at the Concord Athenaeum. And so he came and he gave the talk about the river trip. And in the Q&A, all anybody wanted to know was what it was like to live in a shack at Walden Pond. So I believe that Q&As are magic. And I know that this one will not disappoint us. All right, here we go. The pilgrims landed the Mayflower at Cape Cod, Massachusetts on a cold November day in 1620 because they were running out of beer. Their legal charter from King James was for a grant of land in Northern Virginia, but instead they anchored illegally and carved their first community from the sand, laying the foundation of the American character. Since the beginning, drinking and taverns have been as much a part of American life as churches and preachers, or elections and politics. The interesting truth is that a glass of beer, a bottle of rum, a keg of hard cider, a flask of whiskey, or even a dry martini was often the silent, powerful third party to many decisions that shaped the American story from the 17th century to the present. And one of the things that's unusual about American drinking is our ambivalence. So there are countries where people drink more. And there are countries where people drink less. But there is no other country where we were the drunkest country in the world in 1830, and we outlawed it entirely in 1930. And by 1950, we were back to being up there. And now we're on our way back in the other direction. So we get the medal for ambivalence when it comes to drinking. Um, Every century, our drinking pendulum swings wildly, and that's not so true in other countries. That's something, you know, we're, we're a country of extremes, and we either love it or hate it. So now I'm going to read the longest of the three sections, which, you know, it's been said by, actually, a Washington native, Strobe Talbot, that in his wonderful book, the Great Experiment, I'm always selling other people's books, that, um, that we began to win the Civil War when Lincoln fired his sober general, George McClellan, and hired his drunken general, Ulysses S. Grant. And indeed, that is when the tide seemed to turn, and it did seem to turn because of Grant's uh, a can-do attitude, what are we going to call it, because of Grant's refusal to admit defeat, because of Grant's forward motion that nobody could seem to stop. Uh, as Lincoln said uh, of Grant, he's a man who gets, G-I-T, right? He was also a man who drank. So here goes Grant. Um, of all the drunken generals who fought during the Civil War, and there were many, the one who most famously battled the bottle was Ulysses S. Grant. Born the son of a leather goods producer in Ohio, Grant was sent to West Point, where he graduated in the bottom half of his class. At West Point, he fell in love with his roommate's sister, Julia Boggs Dent. He proposed. She demurred. He proposed. She asked for more time. His father disapproved of Julia. Her parents disapproved of him. After a four-year courtship, he finally won her over, and they were married in 1848. The couple adored each other in war and peace, in sobriety and drunkenness. They had four children, 
Almost 40 years later, Grant's dying act was to finish his great autobiography, Personal Memoirs of Ulysses S. Grant, so that they could be supported after he died. A soldier's life is not his own, and Grant was posted from camp to camp, finally ending up in Fort Humboldt in Wairika, California. Here, with his beloved wife and family far away, his drinking began to catch up with him. There was plenty of tolerance for drinking in the military, but less tolerance for a drunk. Grant was a small man, 5'2", who became famous for being unable to hold his liquor. He would sometimes get drunk on what appeared to be one glass, and other times would drink a great deal. Grant's commander at Fort Humboldt, Colonel Robert Buchanan, took offense. He gave Grant the choice of resigning his post and his military career or having charges pressed against him. Grant resigned. Suddenly, at the age of 32, and with a family to support, Grant had no profession. His father, who still disapproved of Julia and even of his own grandchildren, offered him a job in the leather business if his wife and children would leave and go home to her family. They refused. The couple refused. Instead, Grant tried farming, which didn't work out, and finally his father came around and offered him a job with no conditions. So Grant moved his family back to Galena, Illinois, and joined his father's store. But what of the alcoholism and binge drinking that had gotten him booted out of the army? Under Julia's gentle influence, Grant, who thought she was much too good for him, was able to moderate his drinking. Half afraid, half eager to be the husband he felt she deserved, he was apparently able to drink less when he was at home than he almost inevitably drank as a soldier. Like many alcoholics, he struggled to control his drinking, a struggle that was sometimes more successful than others. When the war began in April 1861, Grant acted decisively. Soon he was the head of a company of Illinois volunteers who launched an attack from Cairo, Illinois, on the Confederate armies near the important junction of the Ohio and Mississippi rivers. At this point, Grant did not drink, and he did not tolerate drinking among his men. Grant's forces won, and this early victory for the Union after the demoralizing defeat of Bull Run made him famous. Grant's next engagement was more complicated and perilous, but equally victorious. Now a major general, Grant led his forces south to Corinth, Mississippi, on the Tennessee River, where the Confederate Army was massed. And by this time, of course, he had started drinking again. On the morning of April 6, 1862, the Confederate Army launched a surprise attack with the aim of wiping out the main Union, Union Army once and for all. The first day of the battle at Pittsburgh Landing, which is also the battle at Shiloh, as you know, all these battles have two names, right? And the Confederates named the battles after the places where they were fought, Sharpsburg, Manassas, Bull Run, am I getting this right? And the Union Army named them after a landmark, Shiloh, Antietam, etc. Okay, so... I call it Pittsburgh Landing, but it was really Shiloh. All right, I'll call it Shiloh. The first day of the Battle of Shiloh was disastrous for the Union, but Grant's troops held on, fighting desperately in the mud, although Grant himself was not around. It was said that he was visiting troops across the river. Night fell without a, treat, a retreat from the Union, although many of the men were two miles closer to the Tennessee River and defeat from where they had begun the day. The troops were exhausted, Many people thought the Union was beaten, including the Union general and Grant's friend, William Tecumseh Sherman, who was called Kump. Sherman had been in the thick of the battle all day, slowly losing ground. Grant had been absent during the first day, and his men thought he had been drinking. Sherman, who had his own struggles with reputation when he had been treated for a nervous condition earlier in the war, was ready to quit. Perhaps he thought the war was over. Then during the night, Grant reappeared. It was raining hard, and Grant set up camp under a tree, ignoring the pain from an ankle injury caused when he had fallen off his horse when he was away the evening before. General Sherman found Grant under this big oak tree just before dawn, smoking a large cigar. The rain was heavier, and thunder and lightning had begun to flash through the trees. Sherman was coming to talk about the details of what seemed inevitable a Union retreat. 
The trees were dripping water, the battlefields were a sea of mud, but Grant was placidly puffing away as if he were in a gentleman's club with a snifter of brandy. As the storm passed away to the south, the two men stood quietly looking toward the rolling hills beyond the battlefield in the darkness. Standing there, Sherman found he couldn't bear to talk about retreat, although he still believed it was necessary. Well, Grant, we've had the devil's own day, haven't we, he said. Yes, Grant replied. We'll lick him tomorrow, though. Grant was right. Instead of being finished off the next day, the Union launched a furious counterattack and drove the Confederate Army back to its original position. Later in the war, Sherman summed up his friendship with Grant for a reporter. General Grant is a great general, he said. I know him well. He stood by me when I was crazy, and I stood by him when he was drunk. And now, sir, we stand by each other always. <laughs> so that's Grant and Kump. And, and now I'm going to go to the conclusion, which the more I, the more I, I, I guess I don't reread it, the, the more I think about this book, the more I become interested in the different ways that we write history. Um, and I, I do think that there's a new kind of writing history that's growing up in this country that's very exciting. And I do think that more and more historians are including people's intimate lives rather than just the monumental parts and the big inventions. Um, and there are many historians who are doing this, who actually take you to the place and let you be in the scene with the people that they're writing about. And uh, that's what, uh, you know, I hope to be one of those historians. I hope that I, in this book, take you to that place and let you feel what it was like to be Grant on that night or let you feel what it was like to be Ethan Allen at Ticonderoga. Also somewhat drunk. Um, okay, so this is my uh, conclusion, and we're coming back to the Mayflower uh, for the for the uh, my final words about the nature of history. In the second week of December 1620, almost a month after the Mayflower landing on Cape Cod, after braving almost unimaginable hardships, the journey, the failed explorations of inhospitable Cape Con Cod sands, a winter storm that almost wrecked the sailing shallop they were using to explore the coast, a dozen men, including Bradford, Winslow, and the soldier Miles Standish, landed in what would come to be named Plymouth Harbor. They landed right around the bend in Provincetown Harbor, but they knew they couldn't settle there. So they spent a month looking for a place to settle. Now, I'm not saying that this happened because the ration was a gallon of beer a day, but they were between two of the greatest harbors in the world, New York and Boston. And what did they do? They got in their shallop and like made little circles until they found a place to settle, Plymouth. Okay, not that there's anything wrong with Plymouth. Um, but they had to drink beer because they couldn't drink the water. So the way you drink water, they drank beer. So if there's any possible thing that they might have needed to do with a clear head, that was very difficult for them. I mean, you know. Anyway, that's not the point of this paragraph. Sorry. Um, <laughs> for Bradford, the pilgrim story was parallel to the biblical story of Exodus. New world Israelites they had, with God's help, finally found their Canaan. Bradford's view of history, like many of his companions on the Mayflower, was entirely shaped by his knowledge of the King James Bible Old Testament, which had been completed just a few years earlier. Every sea was the Red Sea. Every voyage was the voyage of the Israelites. Every hardship was biblical. Bradford's worldview made him an effective leader and a resilient soul. Whatever happened to the pilgrims happened in a larger spiritual and historic context overseen by an erratic but ultimately loving God. This was the controlling idea through which he saw, understood, and wrote about everything. Bradford took history personally. Modern history, unlike Bradford's history, claims to be objective. Our historians write as if they're reporting events with an unbiased eye. This happened, and then that happened. This is our modern equivalent of God's will, an observant neutrality occasionally punctuated with some wise commentary. 
There are many advantages to this kind of history. The historian ostensibly has no ax to grind, no idea to sell, no political point to make. But there are also disadvantages. One is that in taking a broad, dispassionate view, historians miss a lot. Their emphasis is on the sweep of time, not on the moments that make up our lives. They are never personal. Their opinions and the assumptions on which they base their lives are hidden. Their history is as far away from memoir as it can get. In these books, we see the panoply of history through the narrow keyhole of our own day and time, our own beliefs and knowledge. We're stuck in the first quarter of the 21st century, and looking back over the past 400 years is like trying to make out the details of a ship on a far horizon. Historians make many decisions about how to deal with this. Should we bring modern knowledge to bear on the characters we write about? What kind of language should we use? How will we acknowledge the differences in language between then and now? How will we factor in our own tolerance for, say, women's rights or racial integration into times where those things were unheard of? So those are the questions. And now um, I'm going to go to Rhonda really set me up perfectly. Um, the national character. What creates a national character? America is another name for opportunity, wrote Ralph Waldo Emerson. It's an opportunity that starts with the pilgrims taking the opportunity and landing in the wrong place. The American attitude toward the law, the American attitude toward hardship, the American insistence on doing things to benefit the individual all come from that cold afternoon in Provincetown Harbor. Character is a combination of environment and experience, and the American character was being formed in those minutes when the pilgrims finally, exhaustedly, reached the beach. To survive, they will have to develop a fierce individualism and a craving for freedom that will spread down from the bent arm of the Cape toward what will become the Louisiana Purchase and westward to where their feisty spirit will settle huge tracts of land and explore seemingly impassable rivers and mountain ranges. The American character has been formed by a hundred forces. Defining it, as someone has written, is like trying to nail jelly to a wall. Still, to try it, it began with New England with the Pilgrims landing that afternoon in what is now Provincetown Harbor, driven by many forces, both natural and man-made. And one of those forces, a force of both pleasure and pain, a force of both brilliance and incompetence, was their passionate connection to drinking. Okay, thanks. So questions. Yes. Exciting new history that you talked about writing about. Is it that you think that, and what do you try to aim with this secret history, somewhat of a blurring of the lines between like psychoanalysis of history and history? Not at all. I don't think it's about getting inside people's psyches. We can't do that. I think. Oh, yes, exactly. So this young man is very intelligently asking, I'm going to try to rephrase his question fairly, um, if this new kind of history that I'm talking about is more like psychoanalysis than history, or is more like psychoanalysis than the old history, or is anything like psychoanalysis? And my answer is no. In other words, I don't think this new history that I'm talking about or that I'm writing is going to get inside people's psyches. That's a whole other, that's what novelists do, I hope, on a good day. Um, I think it's about the details that make up their everyday lives. In other words, you can say the Wright brothers invented the airplane, or you can say, uh, you know, on such and such a date, Wilbur Wright's shoes hurt. And he had uh, okra for breakfast. In other words, that's this is it's a bad example, but I'm talking about getting down into the lives, drilling down into the everyday, so that I, as a reader, feel that I was there too. And just to whack on the Wright brothers a little more, what I want to know with the Wright brothers, um, and I'm certainly not saying that 
my questions weren't answered by Dave McCullough's marvelous book, is where did that inspiration come from? I mean, those guys outworked everyone else by a factor of seven million. And what was it that they had coming from Dayton, Ohio, that enabled them to just go back at it and back at it and back at it and back at it until they got it? And then even after they got it, go back at it because nobody cared, right? Go back. So that's what interests me. Yeah. Good question. Oh, Great. Yes. Um, I was just curious as to how you got interested in this topic and putting various historical um, incidents together. So that's a good question. How did I get interested in this topic? So for me, writing comes from obsession. So I usually don't know that I'm writing a book. I usually just can't stop thinking about something. Um, so it's all about obsession. Actually, there's an obsession expert in our audience. Um, and so for a long time, I've been obsessed with American history. I've written a lot of American history. And I've also been obsessed with alcoholism and recovery, um, and both because I have personal experience with it. My father had experience with it. And it's very interesting. So I think one day I knew about the pilgrims and the beer. It's fairly commonly known. And one day I thought, whoa, I wonder if these two things actually go together somehow. And I, so I started reading, starting with The Pilgrims, and I was amazed. I mean, this is the book where I sat on the floor of the library going, you're kidding. <laughs> you know, really? I mean, it was really, I was so surprised. There were so many things. Senator Joseph McCarthy, I had no idea. You know, but he died of cirrhosis. Right. I mean, there's no but and I mean, I, I was very careful not to do any guessing to keep the bar for alcoholism. If you don't die of liver, liver disease before you're 40, you're not an alcoholic in my definition in this book. So I, I you know, I kept it as small as I could. But it was amazing to me the effect that that alcohol had on our history, starting with the American Revolution. You know, which arguably, which was planned in the basement of the Green Dragon Tavern, the Boston Tea Party, they went to those ships to secure the tea, to secure the tea so it couldn't be shipped back to England. And guess what? They threw it overboard instead. And guess where they had just been? The Green Dragon Tavern. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, over and over again, I was like, what? So in that way, it was very satisfying. Thanks. Good question. Hi, Susan. Thanks for appearing here. I'm going to start with an observation, which will then lead me into the question. Um, as a uh, reporter, I think your ability to take this disparate information and bring it together is fantastic. Thank you. Uh, as a retired educator, I should have said retired reporter, as a retired educator, um, I would, if I weren't so lazy, I would actually like to come back and write a curriculum with lesson plans for the book. I think you did such a great job of making it real and and, and law. I mean, you can't argue with what you've read, and I think kids would be interested in that. There are very few schools in America that would let you promote that, but it would really make history alive. Uh, the last thing as a recovering alcoholic and addict, I think your writing is, is very important. Uh, you made Bill W. and other people just live. So as my students would have said, you got skills. There's no question about that. Okay, Thank now you. the question. Uh, so we've established your independent, but you are the daughter of John Cheever. I consider one of the great American writers in, in that pantheon. And not from the personal end, you've talked about that, you've never been hesitant about it, but from the professional end, what are the advantages of being John Cheever's daughter have you found? And I'm sure there are, as anything, there are some disadvantages too. Could you comment somewhat on that, the advantages and disadvantages sure, of being John's daughter? Sure, the question is, I think, I think you can all hear these questions, right? Now. So my daughter's in the audience, I'm not gonna tell you which one she is, of course, but. No, just know that as I answer this question, um, so, you know, how can one talk about one's parents in two minutes? The, you're right. There were many advantages and many disadvantages. Let me just say that the, the advantages people think I had are not the ones I had. My father did not want me to be a writer. He did not want any of us to write. He considered it was a miserable life. It obviously was. I didn't want to be a writer either. I couldn't agree with him more till I was about 35, right? But I saw, you know, and for a long time I was like, I learned nothing from him. And he was very careful not to teach me anything. 
Uh, once when I was in my 30s, I took him out to lunch. I had a house count at the Four Seasons in those days. I was a reporter. Right. And I took him out to lunch and I said, OK, you teach people. Give me some writing advice. And he said, don't use dialogue tags. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so, you know, I did not get writing advice from him, um, although that's pretty good advice. Uh, so, But I did see that writing was something you could do. And I did see that sometimes he was so excited that he couldn't keep himself from reading his work to us. You know, I could see that there was some, you know, with all the misery and with all the we can't pay for braces and with all the you have to go to public school now and with all the all that stuff. Right. And and all the misery and all the late nights and all the, you know, in the house where we lived, my father had a little study and I and my bedroom were both on the same floor. So I knew he was in there knocking around at three in the morning, you know. Um, so but still. I saw him. Do, I saw it, that it was doable, and that really all you, all he did was he just did it every day, all the time, and so that I think was a huge benefit. And the other great benefit was, I grew up in a household where books were king. And you know, I remember this is one of my best stories about my father. I'm not going to like answer all night, but you know, we were living in Italy for a while, and so English books were gold. And he went out one day and he came back with The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. I was 12. <sighs> and so I started reading it. And when the time came to go to school, I told him I was sick. I said, I'm way too sick to go to school. And I had the book under my covers and I was like, oh, I'm so sick. And he came into my bedroom and he saw the book and he said, okay. Cool. You know, so it was that kind of household. And I think that, you know, all good writing comes from reading. You know, if you're not reading all the time, you probably, it's going to be very hard for you to write well. And so that also was a huge advantage growing up in that household. We were all talking about books all the time and reading books all the time. Did I answer your question? You did, and I don't see anyone else with the microphone, so I'm going to use my old reporter's uh, prerogative and ask a follow-up unless somebody needs to. Then you come over and I'll follow you. No, 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 no. Well, okay, we won't, we won't spend time arguing over it. I thought one of the most interesting parts of your book, and I never really considered it, was, and you talked about the flow and change in America, which we do consider, but just from a writing standpoint, you had Emerson, Thoreau, Hawthorne, and then you had the crazy Poe, who was really, Edgar was right. the only one, and they don't know if he's probably more dipsomaniac than right. an alcoholic. And then you go through the period of Hemingway, Fitzgerald, et cetera, and your all the way up to your father and, and his contemporaries, heavy drinkers, again, the madman era, but that kind of thing. And now I do think, if you look at writers today, very much in a decline of-, of Not drinking. Uh, not drinking, some drugs, but not the same. Now, and it also parallels, so do you think the writers are ahead of their time, reflecting their time? Uh, what's your thoughts on that? Because uh, you know, that's always a question, are writers ahead, reflecting? So we'll just- Well, so this gentleman's referring to what to me is the most interesting chapter in the book, sure. where I tackled the the idea that all writers have to drink, that drinking is sometimes somehow helpful to writing. And what I pointed out when I thought about it a little bit is that this only was true from 1920 to 1980. It was not true in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. As you remember, F.O. Matheson said all of American literature was written in five years between 1850 and 1855. He's referring to Moby Dick, Longfellow, The Scarlet Letter, Emerson, Walden, all those books, right? Those five years, those guys didn't drink. They weren't drinkers. So if, drink, if you have to drink to write, what about all those guys who wrote American literature? And so, you know, I, I kept looking and looking, and I realized that the whole myth in this country of drinking and writing is just these two generations of writers. And I believe that it was caused, or at least partly caused, by prohibition, which, of course, made drinking far more attractive to writers who, you know, need to find their own way, break the law, whatever you want to call it. Um, and now writers now don't drink. Our contemporary writers don't drink. There's the occasional, you know, but really they don't. So it, it's a very isolated moment. And I actually don't think they were ahead of the, their time or behind their time. I think it just has nothing to do with writing. In other words, I think those guys were drunk because of prohibition. Drinking looked really good. They did it. Um, and I think when the effects of prohibition wore off, 
writers stop doing it. I, I actually don't think that it, that drinking is going to help your writing or really hurt it, at least not for a while. In the end, it does hurt it, of course. But I, I think those two things are separate. But the question that I can't answer is, why do people want to believe this? Why are you all going to walk out of here and say, yeah, she was really smart, but that thing she said about writing not related to right. drinking, that's not right. right. <laughs> and, and I don't have the answer to that. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to go back to your comments about um, history and the new history because um, I'm a business journalist and I've been sort of really irritated at this tendency of the, a lot of his business journalism that writes about history, especially about the crisis and about some of the some of the things in the past. They write it to be HBO ready, um, and you lose a lot of the details. And I think, you know, when you have a cultural history, that might be nice to be there, to be at Plymouth Rock. But when you're talking about subjects that need the details, and instead they're worried about what color tie they were wearing, I, I, I don't know, maybe you could just elaborate a little bit more about some of the tre trends or tendencies you're seeing in that kind of writing, nonfiction writing, um, amongst your, your yeah, colleagues okay. and peers. Yeah, I'm, okay. I'm just appallingly ignorant when it comes to business writing, so I can only guess. I, I think, essentially, memoir has eaten biography and is now on its way to eating history, and I'm all for that. Um, I'm a big fan of memoir, and so I just think what's happening is there's more and more intimacy in all of our writing. And let me just whack about memoir for two minutes, okay? Memoir has a tremendous political dimension. It has given a voice to people who never had a voice before. Women, servants, people who w didn't write books before, people whose stories weren't heard before. And because of that, it, it, you know, we've developed something I call memoir shame. In other words, authority, when challenged, bites back. And I think we're at the beginning of the golden age of memoir, and we've only begun to see what can be done with memoir. But I think at the same time, memoir with its intimacy is sort of irresistible. And it's certainly now, if you notice, when you read a profile of someone in a magazine, the writer is always also a character. In other words, that's moving forward in that way. And I think it's also going to happen with history, that we're going to have more and more a real feeling about what these people's lives were like, you know? Really, I don't I don't want to go back to the Wright brothers. Think of another book of history that we've all read. Re well, with the pilgrims, really, I don't want to know that they did this amazing thing and they discovered this new world. I want to know, were they hungry? You know, I, I hate this word relatable, but I want to know in what way were they like me? You know, what, what was what was on their minds? What did they worry about? Um, so that's, I think, what I'm talking about when I talk about the new history, although it certainly sounds pretentious, doesn't it? Sorry about that. Yeah, next question. I want to talk a little bit about the uh, schizophrenia in America between mm. drinking and not drinking. And I loved uh, starting this with the Battle of Shiloh in Pittsburgh Landing. Um, I'm from Tennessee, and of course the entire economy of Tennessee before the Civil War consisted of whiskey, which was then transported up the Tennessee River from Pittsburgh Landing down to New Orleans to sell it. It was their only cash crop. But then later, half of the counties in Tennessee to this day are still dry. So mm. I'd like you to comment on how you could go from the sole economy on a cash basis before the Civil War to half of the counties being dry today and how that transformation happened historically and where you think it's going to go because I know you have observations about well, that. Well, yeah, I don't, again, ignorance. I don't know much about Tennessee history, but that's certainly what we do. Um, we were only able to... Uh, passed the Prohibition Amendment because, you know, the entire, thanks to Alexander Hamilton, the entire economy of the United States was based on liquor taxes until 1916. So we couldn't have Prohibition, right? <laughs> but so they passed the Income Tax Amendment, and then we could have Prohibition. 
So it's so weird how we are about this. And, you know, this coming together of of dry and wet is just, I mean, the same counties that had liquor as their primary means of income become dry. I mean, our ambivalence is astonishing. I don't have, you know, the tablets on which it's written why we're so ambivalent. All I can notice is that we are. But I think it's part of the American, the extremes of the American character, right? Either we, I'm not going to mention any issues here because here we are in D.C., but either we're pro this or anti that. You know, we're a very passionate people. How's that? (laughs) Can I just ask one more question? Sure. You're you're the first person I know who's um, talked about alcoholism and history. So this is why I want to ask you this question. It has to do with Paris yesterday. Um, my experience with alcoholism is it's an addiction in that once you take one drink, you want more or a sip, you want more. Um, and to me, I mean, I've never thought about this like this until I was sitting here. To me, terrorism is an addiction of sorts also. One has a, a firm belief about something and once you start wanting to push that belief and punishment, you know, on other people, it keeps going. And in fact, what ISIL has said, or what's been reported they said is, you know, this is just the beginning of the storm. So as a person who has talked about the relationship of history and this addiction, do you have any thoughts about about this other addiction of terrorism or what we, an understanding of it? Thanks. Well, it's a terrifying question. And I, I don't, know uh, how it works with ISIS, but I do know um, that the 9-11 guys were drinking the night before. Um, and that's pretty much all I know. In other words, I don't, I don't see alcoholism the way you do. I think for most people, they can have a drink and it's no big deal. And they can have to, you know, for an alcoholic, whoever that is, um, you know, whether you're born that way or who even knows, there's a mystery to it. If you have a drink, you want more and then more and then more and then more. So I don't know if that's how terrorism works, but it's a very interesting question. And I urge you to find out and let me know. (laughs) How's that? Thanks. Thanks. I'll try. (laughs) Thank you very much, Susan. Thanks, Rhonda.